More than a half century ago, the Peregrine Fund received its first donation tucked inside a letter written by two young children. We accepted those few dollars and made a promise in return to safeguard the future of the Peregrine Falcon and the future all children would soon inherit. Ever since, the Peregrine Fund has worked tirelessly to fulfill that promise. So that today, species nearly lost are making their way back again. Landscapes are being preserved for future generations. And wedding conservationists and leaders are flourishing. Nuestro trabajo está lejos de terminar. As our planet, birds of prey, and all other life face ever-growing challenges, we are prepared to face them head on. With more than 50 years of groundbreaking, donor-driven conservation work behind us, we know that when we all come together, challenges can become opportunities. And this is our opportunity to forge a future where species no longer need saving. Where science, knowledge, and discovery are valued. Where connections are formed and hearts are changed. Where together, humans and wildlife thrive. This is our future, and you can be a part of it. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for attending the 27th annual California Condor Release in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management to celebrate National Public Lands Day. My name is Alicia Lee Cox. I'm the Assistant Director at the World Center for Birds of Prey, which is the Peregrine Fund headquarters in Boise, Idaho, where we are broadcasting from live today. The Peregrine Fund is a global organization that focuses on conserving birds of prey around the world and one of our largest projects just so happens to be what we are all together celebrating today, the California condor. Also live from the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument in Marble Canyon, Arizona, we have Tim Houck, our condor reintroduction program director at the Peregrine Fund. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Alicia. It's really nice to be here with you today. And thank you to everybody who's joining us on the live stream. This is the third year we've been able to do this live stream. And as always, we're really excited to bring condor releases to you in your home, something that doesn't happen every single day. So certainly something we're celebrating and we're celebrating this in conjunction with uh, National Public Lands Day, the Bureau of, L Bureau of Land Management. So this is kind of a, a dual celebration. We're celebrating public lands and we're celebrating condors. Tim, for those of us that haven't seen this event before, what, what exactly can we expect? Yeah, uh, well, to just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, we don't exactly know. So these birds <laughs> are are in the release pen that you can see, and they're going to be free to go as they please at noon condor time here in Arizona. And it's up to them. So this is a soft release. They can leave whenever they want. Uh, we're not going to force them out. So hopefully they get all excited and get ready and willing and, uh, willing and able to take that first flight into the wild. So these birds have never flown before. Wow. Wow. Um... How are the conditions? I mean, they look pretty clear out there. Um, wondering how things are going over there. Actually, it's beautiful. It's, we've got like 62 degrees, sunny with a light wind. So perfect conditions uh, for these five youngsters to make their first, first uh, day in the wild a good one. Well, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, folks that are tuning in, if you haven't already, make sure to order this year's commemorative t-shirt. It is a beautiful design by Tatum Talbot about, with our condors flying in the canyon. And you can find it actually linked in the YouTube description of this event. But also we're going to go ahead and throw it into the chat. So if you're interested in purchasing one of those commemorative t-shirts, go ahead and check out the chat. As of this morning, we've sold about 202 t-shirts and raised $2,360. And we're also this year trying to hit a fundraising goal of $27,000 um, for the 27th annual release, where you can donate directly to the Peregrine Fund um, and utilize that QR code that's on the screen 
so that you can donate to the Peregrine Fund and the Condor Recovery. How cool, right? So, man, it's uh, so important to mention all of you watching because uh, being a small nonprofit, we rely on folks like you to help make programs like this function. So we do get some funding uh, from federal partners and state partners, but the vast majority of our funding actually comes from private donorship. So uh, we thank you in advance if you can make a donation fantastic. If you can't uh, make a donation, we understand. Uh, just support condors with your heart and, uh, and spread the word about how amazing these, these birds truly are. All right. Also, just so everyone's aware, we'll have some time after the release pen is open um, to answer some questions. So if anyone has any questions that they're burning questions about condors or about the release um, in general, go ahead and put them in the chat, in the YouTube chat, and we will get back to them later on when we have some time. We will be back with more in a minute, but first we're gonna hear a word from one of our partners. My name is Joel Donahue and I'm a wildlife technician at Grand Canyon National Park. We partner with the Paragon Fund to monitor the California condors within the Grand Canyon using telemetry. It's definitely a lot rare to see them up on the North Rim. I personally have not seen one on the North Rim. I could probably go to the south room right now and point one out today for you, but um, yeah, it's just a lot lot harder up here compared to the south. Such few numbers, 500 or so in the world, you know, to be able to get to see some be released into the wild is uh, a great pleasure. Welcome back, everyone. It looks like we have about 25 minutes left until our release pen is open and we get to witness these iconic birds fly in the wild for the very first time. Hey Tim, I'm pretty curious and I'm sure folks at home are as well. How is the condor population doing? Well, actually it's doing pretty well. So uh, it's days like this that, that give us even a bigger boost. So this is uh, going to add five birds into the wild population and we Currently have about 109 birds in the Southwest population here in Arizona and Utah. Um, so on the, all in all, the birds are, they're increasing. We're seeing uh, wild breeding reproduction in the wild, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we need. Uh, we're still performing these uh, releases of captive birds as well. So those numbers are, are always increasing because of those, those events that, that we do, the, the wild reproduction and uh, the releases. Uh, of course, there are threats to condors, right? We uh, know that the number one threat to condors is actually lead poisoning. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that today through the broadcast, but uh, that is our biggest obstacle right now. But all, all the other threats for these young birds actually out here are predators. So they're inexperienced and they're learning. So we're going to be out here for the next few weeks. We're going to guide them on this journey. So we'll give them a little bit of a hand if they need it. So the biggest predators for condors are coyotes and golden eagles out here. So uh, we're going to keep an eye out for those potential predators and uh, step in if we have to, but hopefully they'll pick up on, on being a wild condor pretty quick. Wow. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that it's, that it's disappointing to lose a bird to predation, but, but I hear that your team had a similar encounter with predation this year um, with an amazing ending. Yeah. Yeah. We actually had a bird that was attacked by a golden eagle, a young wild hatch condor. And it was found by a, a local hiker. And so if they, we were alerted and we were able to take quick action and get into this canyon, uh, find this bird injured in the bottom of the canyon, rescue the bird from the canyon, hike it out the two miles to the top of the rim and get it to a, a rehab facility down at Liberty Wildlife, uh, one of our partners where they could take care of this bird, uh, bring it back to health. And then ultimately we were able to release it back to the wild. Pretty cool. It's an overcast morning in late January, and a team of biologists from the Peregrine Fund are headed out on a unique and critical mission. So we had a report from a hiker that Condor 999 was seen in this canyon, a potentially injured left wing. Hopefully it's fine and we don't have to worry about it. We could just go do a welfare check, but uh, we'll prepare for the worst. The Condor is at the bottom of Ryder Canyon, an offshoot of the Grand Canyon. To reach it will require the team to hike two and a half miles out and almost a thousand feet straight down. Condors don't actually need our help that often, but when it does happen, it's every minute matters. If this bird is sick, if this bird is injured, every single second matters. 
The team reaches the bottom, and 999 is exactly where the hiker left him, and clearly in need of help. The team formulates a plan to capture him, but they have to be careful. You only got one shot. If this bird flies off, injured, we may not be able to get to it again. The team creeps closer, closer, and finally, success. But 999's journey is only just beginning. It's another arduous hike back out of the canyon, and then a trip by car to the team's headquarters. So we have a, a location on site where we're taking 999, uh, where we have medical supplies so that we can take care of a bird in this kind of situation. The team quickly begins treatment, but what they're finding isn't good. This bird had some gaping wounds in its abdominal cavity. Uh, what this looks like right now is uh, an aerial predator. Uh, golden eagles have been known to come after condors. We won't know for sure, but man, these wounds are they're intense and uh, they need attention. 999's wounds require more care than the team is able to provide, which means it's time for another road trip. This one to Liberty Wildlife, a wildlife rehabilitator located in Phoenix. The bird had to be put under anesthesia and um, basically operated on to, uh, to patch this bird up. We'll check the sutures this Saturday. They'll probably come out in 10 to 14 days, probably closer to the 14 day mark. And at that point, you might be able to head back up to the cliffs. Basically everything that this bird's gone through, it's gonna be able to recover from. So that's what we wanted to hear. And if all goes well, he'll be back home in no time. It takes a month of recovery, but finally, 999 is healthy enough to return to Northern Arizona. We just released it back into our flight pen, so this is going to give it that opportunity to strengthen those muscles that were weakened during this month that it hasn't been out in the wild. And two more weeks of recovery later, Condor 999 is cleared for takeoff. All the observations from the field crew are that the bird is using its wings well, it's flying across the pen. Everything looks great, so we're ready to release this bird into the wild. I mean, I can't even describe to you the feeling of being able to release a bird, especially when the story is so personal to us. Every one of these birds is so important. Every one of these hundred plus birds in this population here. So watching him fly off the cliff, take flight, get that air under his wings again. It, it really is special to us. I mean, that's where he's meant to be. Wow. That was an incredible rescue mission that the team pulled off for Condor 999. Amazing job to you, Tim, and the field crew. Who else happens to be helping track all of these birds? That's a great question. Yeah, we have so many partners in this program, you know, um, that are helping us to do things like monitor and track condors. And the two that come to mind right off the bat are Grand Canyon National Park and Zion National Park, who both have condors in their in their national parks, and they can track those birds with radio telemetry, just like we do. And so that's a great support uh, for the condor program. Uh, so many other partners that are also involved, such as the Bureau of Land Management, who we're working with today, uh, also the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, we have the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who manages the entirety of the programs. Um, also, the national forests like Dixie National Forest and the Kaibab National Forest and many of the captive breeding facilities, uh, as well as Liberty Wildlife, are rehabbers. Um, how about we take a look at our Zion National Park partners? Welcome to your new home, Condors. We're here, we're waiting, and we're excited to see you. Welcome, new Condors. Come on out of that cage and start your new lives and fly away. <laughs> new Condors, soar high, have fun, be safe. Hey, I'd like to welcome you new Condors to the world here and come up to Zion and visit us. Hopefully I'll see you at our stations at Big Ben and Angels Landing. We hope we'll see you over there at, up at Scouts Lookout. Good luck and we love our birds. <laughs> yeah. Long and healthy flight. Hope, hope to see you in Zion! Zion. 
Welcome back. It looks like we only have about 17 minutes until we get to see these condors have the choice to leave the pen for the first time and fly free in the wild. If you guys haven't had a chance to pick up your commemorative tea yet, go ahead and check out the link to the t-shirt fundraiser in the chat. Remember that all the funds for the t-shirts are gonna go directly to condor recovery today. So please get your t-shirt today. Also just a reminder that everyone that is participating in this live stream, we're gonna have some time after the release pen is open to answer any of your questions. So go ahead and post in the chat um, if you'd like, and then um, we will go ahead and we'll, we'll answer them towards the end. Tim, last year you mentioned that the release pen had been completely revamped. Did you guys have any other big construction projects this year? Yeah, we did actually. So the release pen that you're looking at now in that, in that live feed is uh, all new metal construction that uh, the crew, uh, we all did that. We took part in a huge rebuild and uh, we decided to take that over to our flight pen as well. So that's our second aviary off the room where uh, these birds kind of spend the first a few months of their life acclimating to this new environment. So we did an entire flight pen rebuild uh, where we uh, tore the old one down, all wood, got rid of it and rebuilt most of that uh, from the ground up. So pretty cool project, a lot of effort, but it just goes to show you how much that a small nonprofit can and, and kind of has to do sometimes to get the job done because we're up here on top of the Vermont Cliffs, not an easy place to do something like that. So kudos to the crew uh, and all the hard work that everybody put into getting that done. Pretty Just cool. a, a quick differentiation between the flight pen and the um, release pen. What's the difference between right. those two? So you're looking at the release pen, which is where the birds will be released from. The released from, from the flight pen is actually where they were going to acclimate, like I said, also gain that muscle structure needed to take the first flight, as well as learn how uh, social behaviors like feeding and interacting with other birds in the pen. So, uh, Wow. Yeah. I am just amazed all of the time. Um, a few years ago, I had the chance to visit you guys in the field and witness all the unbelievable work that you do year round. And I didn't realize before I had went to visit the Vermilion Cliffs, all of the hats that each crew member wears and all that it takes to do what you do to keep this species from going extinct. Um, why don't you share a little bit about the day in the life of a condor field biologist? I wish that I could give you an exact day in the life, but every day is completely different, which keeps this job really fresh for us. Uh, not only are we monitoring condors, but we're taking action when needed if a condor is in trouble, like we showed you with 999. We're also doing a lot of education and outreach. So uh, kind of what we're doing today, we're going to share condors and and tell people everything we know and just get this information out there so that you can go out and tell your friends about condors and how cool they are so uh, we want people to fall in love with condors after this is over um, let's see we also uh, we have a fantastic crew so i don't want to leave them out and i think it's really important that we introduce them to you all because those are the people doing the hard work on the ground so uh, without further ado, let's let the crew, crew introduce themselves. Uh, my name is CJ Woodward. My name is Heather Morris. My name is Julian Moulton. Jesse Wilson. Sierra Martin. Alex Ramsey. Aaron Brannon. Josh Young. Releasing condors is an exciting thing to be a part of. Everybody is coming together, all of our partners, our biologists, our volunteers, the public, and we're all able to share this one special moment. All the preparation all kind of comes down to that moment when that young bird first kind of wobbles over the edge of the cliff. The most exciting part is kind of not knowing exactly what is going to be coming up. The new birds, you know, they've been in captivity their whole lives, so they don't know what they're doing yet. They haven't learned the social hierarchy. They haven't learned about coyote predation. They haven't learned about where it's good to sleep and where it's not. They've got to kind of learn on the fly, unlike birds that may have hatched in the wild. It's a really crucial time for them and for us to make sure that they're adjusting to this new landscape and making sure that they're finding safe spots to be. We can't just throw a bunch of birds out and hope for the best. We will be spending majority of our time running around chasing after these birds, hiking up cliffs to haze them off of accessible places, seeing what carcasses they're feeding on and seeing every little thing that they're doing. It is a very intensive process with the crew dedicating many hours. This is one of those jobs where you're literally changing the world. 
for a species that was so close to being extinct. This recovery has gone very well over the past 20, 27 years. There's condors here where there were not condors over 20 years ago. A lot of it's down to the birds themselves, but it's also down to our hard work, just looking after these birds and giving them the best chance that they have. We've really put our lives into taking care of these birds, and we really do care about them. It gives you hope that if they can persist, then you know, maybe, maybe things aren't that bad after all. Well, we can't go any further without mentioning our hosts on National Public Lands Day. Yeah, the BLM does some incredible work and we're very lucky to have the partnership that we do with the BLM. So a huge, huge thank you to the BLM for putting on this event with us. Uh, it, it really does take a village and, and they're a big part of it. Just same as all, all our other partners, but this is kind of their day. So this is National Public Lands Day after all. So celebrate your public lands, support your public lands, and uh, the world is a better place with public lands. It's really, really a treat. Good day to you. I'm Mike Herter, the district manager for the Bureau of Land Management's Arizona Strip District. The BLM is proud to manage the public lands and habitat that are home to the California Condor recovery effort. For the past two years, BLM, along with our partners, have worked to rehabilitate nearly 85,000 acres of forest woodlands and sagebrush habitats impacted by the 2020 Mango, Wire Pass, and Pine Hollow wildfires. Thanks to these efforts to maintain this habitat, the California condor recovery work continues to move forward. We appreciate the time, effort, and resources committed to this cooperative recovery program by our partners. We are especially thankful to you, the public, for your great support and enthusiasm for these amazing birds and their struggle to survive. The enormous support and input of time and energy is what makes this program the success that it is. With that, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the 27th annual California Condor release. Thanks again to the BLM. All right, looking at the timer, we are coming up on just about nine minutes away from the gates opening up. Tim, just about, just about how important is partnership in saving the condor? That's very important. I mean, we can't do it alone. And I think one of the great examples of partnership in this program is the relationship that the Peregrine Fund has created uh, or, or worked with uh, Arizona Game and Fish and the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. So those two uh, and, and us, we have worked really hard at trying to tackle this problem that I talked to you guys about with lead poisoning in scavenging wildlife. So uh, condors are susceptible to picking up lead on the landscape and this partnership that we've created has formed into something even bigger. This model that we created here in the Southwest with Utah and Arizona has turned into the North American non-lead partnership, which is nationwide and even going beyond that. So uh, I'd love to introduce a video uh, that kind of explains a bit about, you know, what we do as condor biologists, what the Peregrine Fund does on this program and how the North American non-lead partnership uh, plays a role in that with all of our partners. So enjoy. Easter Sunday, 1987. And for the first time in centuries, North America's largest bird was absent from the skies of the Southwest. The California condor had inexplicably dwindled to just 22 individuals, and scientists had undertaken an unprecedented last-ditch effort to save the species. Scientists decided to capture all remaining California condors, mainly because the population was at a critical number. The population was crashing so fast that if they didn't save the few birds remaining in the wild, they would lose that necessary genetic stock to be able to hopefully breed them in captivity someday and then hopefully find out what the problems were and release them back to the wild. The gamble paid off. A very successful captive breeding program was initiated, um, started at the Los Angeles Zoo, San Diego Wild Animal Park, and then later the Peregrine Fund, we joined, and then after that the Oregon Zoo joined. Almost 1,200 condors have hatched since the beginning of the program, with a few staying back for future breeding, but most of them being released into the wild. 
It's a, a fantastic effort that has culminated over a relatively short period of time where they were able to breed the birds to such a, an extent that they could be released back into the wild. In 1992, the first condors were returned to the wild, the first of many. The California condor was back, but a major problem remained. What had caused the species to nearly disappear in the first place? It's really important to monitor birds to find out causes of mortality. If we can't track the birds, we can't determine what the barriers are for recovery. Each condor is fitted with a radio transmitter prior to release, and that way it gives us an opportunity to monitor what they're feeding on, if they're breeding, uh, movements across the landscape. With every individual condor under careful watch, scientists are able to recover any individuals that die in the wild and examine them to figure out the cause. The results have been startling. 50% of diagnosed death is caused by lead poisoning. The second leading cause of death is predation, and it's less than half that we've lost to lead poisoning. The cause of the condor's decline had finally been determined, but this brought up a new question. Where was the lead coming from? We tested soil, we tested water, we tested fish, everything the condors were eating. And it wasn't until we started transmitting these birds that we released and monitoring them intensively, we found out that there was a seasonality to the lead exposure. And that seasonality coincided here in northern Arizona with the deer hunting season. Scientists had a clue. Lead is common in the landscape, not only from hunting, but also from ranchers culling injured livestock, public safety officers dispatching injured animals, and more. But how was it getting into the condors? We conducted studies and we quantified rates of fragmentation from standard rifle ammunition and we found staggering amounts of fragmentation. Depending on the bullet's construction, it can fragment into hundreds of pieces. And so those small pieces can be left in the remains that we leave in the field and those fragments can then be consumed by scavenging wildlife. And here's the kicker for the condor. They're uniquely vulnerable to lead poisoning because they're an obligate scavenger. All of their sources of food, especially seasonally, can have a high, high probability of having lead in them. At long last, the mystery of condor decline had finally been unraveled, but now to find a solution. There are many things that we can do in the field. You can use non-lead ammunition or remove the remains of an animal that's shot in the field, and it won't contribute to potential lead poisoning in scavenging wildlife. When hunters get the opportunity to uh, participate in conservation efforts, they almost always want to. Mostly what we found is just hunters don't know. So if we share this with them and we share with them how they can find this ammunition and they give it a try, they'll see that it works very well. Enter the North American Non-Lead Partnership, a collective of hunting groups, wildlife management agencies, and other conservation groups dedicated to informing hunters about the importance of non-lead ammunition and encouraging them to voluntarily make the switch. And it's working. About 85 to 90 percent of all of our hunters uh, on the Kaibab Plateau the last 10 years have performed some sort of uh, lead reduction action. We're very encouraged by the results. There's a lot of other sources of lead out there, but through the North American Non-Lead Partnership, we believe we're well on our way. Partnership and collaboration have been key to saving the California condor, but there's one critical partner we have yet to mention. Being a nonprofit, people need to realize that most of the work we do is funded by individual donations and foundations and relationships that we build with people who fund conservation. That's people voting with their dollars and that's very powerful. And so the story of California condor recovery continues to be written. And with a team of partners like this behind them, it's hard to imagine that story not having a happy ending. Currently, the world population sets at over 500 individuals, which is a huge leap forward from where we were. The most important takeaway from that, in my eyes, is what we as a society are capable of. And if we continue that process, I know we can do great things for conservation. We're hopefully working ourselves out of a job. Less captive propagation, less monitoring, not knowing exactly how many birds are out there because we don't need to anymore. We'd like to step back, let the condors do what they can do because we know that they can do it. We've seen the condors breed in the wild. We've seen them thrive. It's there for them. It's there for the taking. One last obstacle to get over. When birds were reintroduced in, their, in the early 90s, there were big questions. Will they find enough food? Will the habitat support them? Will there be nesting habitat? Will they know how to nest? 
All those questions have been answered. The only remaining question is can we overcome the lead issue? And we have a lot of work to do, but we're well on our way. Let you know. Wow, um, amazing to see these successes that have gotten us to where we are today. This is so exciting. It's almost time for our five new condors to join the wild population. Tim, can you tell us who we're about to see flying wild? I would be happy to introduce five birds that we're going to be releasing today. So uh, one way you can follow along with the wild populations is to go to condorspotter.com. Uh, there's a great website that was put together by Tim Huntington, who works with the Tonto Wildlife Society. Um, big shout out to those guys for the great work that they do. Uh, go there. You can learn all about each individual condor. Uh, for today, we have our first condor will be Condor 1061, who's wearing tags 1A. This is a female condor, and she was hatched at the Oregon Zoo, who's another one of our partners in the condor recovery program. Uh, the second bird is going to be 1073. And that bird is tagged 9A, and this is a male. And he is actually the sibling of Condor 1018, who we released in last year's public release. Uh, Condor 1080 is the third bird. Uh, it's wearing tags AO, and this is another male. Uh, he is the sibling of Condor 1044 that we released last year. And these are birds from the World, the World Center of Birds of Prey, where you are today, Alicia, where we have our captive breeding facilities. Uh, we also have Condor 1084, who's wearing tags 5A. This is a female, um, and she is going to be joined by the last bird in the group, Condor 1108, and that bird is wearing tags 2A, and that bird is a male and the sibling of Condor 1025, who was released last year. So all those birds that uh, are, are part of last year's release, you know, there is some relation in that in that uh in the whole game of captive breeding and releases to the wild so those are your birds that we're going to be releasing we're going to see what happens i like i said no guarantees you'll notice also that the feed inside of our release pen uh we actually have some bright sun and the feed overheated so uh, we're trying to cool that down and get it back up online in the meantime we do have the wide lens uh, to show you guys as the birds come out so hopefully we'll get that second feed back up but you know how it goes when you're out in the middle of nowhere things happen. Thanks, Tim. I think, uh, I think we've waited long enough. Let's go ahead and uh, open up those gates and set them free. Yeah. Right, that's a great idea. Uh, I've got a radio here so I can communicate with the biologists and the blind, as well as the public who's down at the live event. And so I'm going to give them the go ahead uh, and let them know we're ready. And we're just going to yeah, we're going to be watching. So if we don't, right. we don't know what, this is exciting. I have no clue what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, hopefully they leave uh, really quite quickly. It, it, like I said, it could be in the first 30 seconds or it could be an hour or two. <laughs> so let's see what happens. I'm going to get everything initiated. You guys will hear a little bit of banter going back and forth on the radio. Um, and here we go. Uh, Chris, you copy. That was me. We're ready up here. The public is ready to see these gates that open. Are you guys ready down there? I'm going to hit the mic and go ahead and repeat that last part. Give me three seconds. All right. We are ready up here. The public is e eagerly awaiting the release of the five condors to the wild. Are you guys ready down there? All right, Aaron in the blind, are you ready to open the gates? Uh, if you're ready, we will we'll, uh, go on your count. Um, open when ready. Ready. Um, I'll open the top door first, uh, then the bottom door. Copy that. Here we go. All right, so Aaron is opening both the doors on the pen to give the, the birds the the easiest access to the environment they're about to enter into. So this is kind of big deal. Um, this is this is bolstering the condor population. It goes up hopefully today by five individuals. So pretty cool. Let's all sit back and, and see what happens. Uh, and I think, you know, you guys are gonna have to keep us informed. 
let us know in the chat if you see some activity that's going on in the pen that looks like the birds might be getting a little bit antsy, maybe uh, willing. Uh, wow. It looks like we already have some action. Hey, which one flew out? I think we had a bar bird fly out already. No way. Breaking records here. Oh my gosh. Which one was it? I don't know. I'm waiting for the crew. So we do have <laughs> wild birds. <laughs> So Nye has officially left the building. Nine we have her first. Five A. Oh, all right. Correction from the biologist. It was five A. Five A. Okay, great. So five A is Condor ten eighty four. So that female has uh, left the release pen and kind of set the tone and set the example for the other birds that are in there. So we'll see if they follow. All right. For those of us listening, um, I know there's some folks from Carolina Friends School that were taking uh, taking some bets on which condor was going to leave the pen first. So just so you know, we had 5A leave the pen. Um, thank you, Dr. Sarah Scholitz at Carolina Friends School for teaching her class about the California condor recovery. And also thank you to the conservation science class for tuning in today. You guys are the future of conservation, so keep up the good work. We have a few questions, I think, from the audience, Tim. Aria Sullivan said, Did these five condors have actual names? Uh, they don't have actual names. So they're given a stud book number at hatching, and we stick with that stud book number or the tag number, which just helps us identify the birds in the field a little bit easier. Uh, so we actually try to stay away from naming the birds. Uh, just kind of uh, everybody has their own practice, and that's kind of the way we do it. Uh, some of the other populations do have names, but uh, we're going to go with numbers for now. Cool. Did we, did you hear what was on the radio there? Yeah, it looks like we had two birds jump up onto the perch. Oh. And am I right in saying that they're they're out of the pen? on the roof to our perch. Okay, so 1061 Stop. has jumped out onto the perch. Okay, 1061. Which is technically out of the pen. So that is Condor 1A. And who was the other bird? Oh yeah, I can see it, okay. This is great. I'm so used to looking through a scope and taking <laughs> observations in the field. And now I'm looking at a video screen in my Vermilion Cliffs office. This is just <laughs> this is incredible. Absolutely, absolutely different experience. So I'm watching it just as you guys are at home, which is great. really cool. We do have a, a couple more questions. How social are condors from Laura Schulbert? How social are condors? Condors are extremely social, so they will often congregate in groups and they will forage uh, for food in, in numbers. So condors are scavengers, they're vultures, a new world vulture species, and they only eat dead animals. So they are the cleanup crew of the environment. They are out there stopping the spread of disease uh, from, from taking over um, anything in the environment. Do dead rotting flesh does not do good things. So <laughs> they're out there to take care of that mess um, and they do a great job at it. So uh, they will feed socially, they'll soar around socially. And this is one of the biggest social gathering spots that we have because this is where we release these birds from. So it's kind of a natal area. It's a very familiar spot to them. And they often return here is this is our management area. And another question we might get is, do we provide food? Uh, we do have some food out on some rocks that are just out of view from the camera and that uh, those are calf carcasses that these young birds have access to. So as they learn how to navigate their new environment for the next few weeks, they have to learn how to feed. And so we're going to give them a little bit of a leg up and we're going to provide some food. But ultimately, condors are excellent scavengers. And within another month or two, these birds are going to be finding food on their own and thriving. The same gal, Laura Schulbert, asked, the video mentioned a social hierarchy. How complicated is it? Mm, it's, uh, it's actually quite complicated when you have 109 birds or 112 birds in your population. Uh, there's definitely a pecking order. And so we do take observations on that. And these birds are starting at the very bottom. Uh, some new releases are more dominant than others. 
and we'll kind of watch that and see how they do. But really what the important, the important thing for us in the next few weeks is to make sure Gosh. these birds are dominant enough to be able to get into a carcass with the older birds. So they're going to get kicked around a little bit because they are the low, low bird on the totem pole. But after a few days, I think they'll, they'll be able to usually muster up the courage to get in on a carcass and, and show what they have as far as um, their place in the dominance hierarchy. So. Right. I had another question from Tom Condor. Is it true that condors mate for life? Ah, uh, yes. It's mostly true that condors mate for life. Like, like all creatures, you know, we sometimes lose our mate and we will repair uh, it just like condors will. So for the most part, condors do mate for life. And we have some pairs that have been together for gosh, 15, 20, yeah, 15 years now, at least. So pretty cool. Um, we follow these pairs annually and we have about 20 breeding pairs in the population that we monitor annually. And, uh, usually we're seeing anywhere from four to five wild, wild fledged condors come out of this Southwest population every season. That's incredible. How are we doing with, how are we doing at the pen there? How many birds are left? Yeah. What do we got? I see a couple birds on the pen. Uh, some of those are wild birds. Uh, okay. that, that were there before the release. Um, obviously the birds that were released are now, now wild too, but you'll notice the head colors, uh, the birds that are older, a five-year-old adult bird will have a red, pink, orange head. Whereas these young birds that we just released are only about a year and a half old. And so they still have a dark black head and that'll start to change when they hit about three and get into that sub-adult status. And then it'll change fully by about five years old when they reach sexually mat sexual maturity. So you can pick out these youngsters by the really bright white clean tags because they haven't been messed up uh, by being in the wild yet and their blackheads. So Great. I can see one day there on the front of the pen, getting a good cool. little look at what's out there in front of them. Uh, I just had an update from the team that we've sold about 226 t-shirts so far and are almost at 3000 for the fundraiser. Let's try and hit 300 folks. Go on wow. and get your commemorative t-shirt. If you haven't already gotten that, we'll throw that link in the chat. That's cool. I got mine. I actually wore it yesterday. I got mine before the event. So uh, <laughs> we, we did provide these t-shirts as well for the people who are down below me at the bottom of the Vermont cliffs celebrating with us in person. And uh, they're all, they're all wearing their shirts today. Um, yeah. I think they came out great. Uh, Tatum Talbot is the artist and she spent um, some time with us over the past year, actually uh, monitoring some of these birds in the wild. And she doesn't uh, necessarily work for condors as a work with condors as a profession, but she certainly fell in love with them. And with her art background, uh, she submitted some incredible designs to our t-shirt contest that we held uh, earlier in the year. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good selection, I think. And, and I hope that you all enjoy it wearing those and supporting condor recovery because all of those donations go directly to the field program. Also the, the really cool hat that you're wearing, I believe we have those available on the Peregrine Fund shop online store at shop.peregrinefund.org. So if any of you condor lovers want to get yourself a hat, a condor hat, go ahead and check that out at shop.peregrinefund.org. Um, we've got plenty of options for folks, different types of hats. Um, if you're, if you're interested in a hat, as well. I do not leave home without my hat. Most people, <laughs> the people that know me are like, oh, you're wearing a condor hat again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. We also have uh, another question from Linda Thompson. How do you decide how many females and how many males to release? Well, we are allocated birds from captive breeding facilities every year, and those birds come down in about August. So they leave from the Oregon Zoo where they leave from the World Center of Birds of Prey or the San Diego Zoo um, and the LA Zoo, all these different breeding facilities uh, that contribute birds from captive breeding to go into the wild. Uh, we don't know if they're gonna be male or female uh, until we get a blood test on these birds because you can't, you can't tell, uh, they're sexually dimorphic. You can't tell the sex without having a blood test. So uh, Male or female, completely random. Uh, how we get them as male and female, it's really based on genetics. So we try to maximize the genetic diversity of these populations. So uh, a team divides these birds up from the cap 
captive breeding facilities and allocates them to the different wild release programs in California, Arizona, and Baja, California, Mexico, uh, based on genetics. So um, it really, male, female is, is less of a concern than genetics, but hopefully we get about a 50-50 is what we're shooting for. We would like to have a nice even number of males and females. So sometimes that skews. Uh, recently, we've had actually more males in the population than females. And the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service gave us a little bit of a, a leg up and started giving us a few more females to start to level that out. But now the opposite is happening. And actually, California is having uh, the same issue where they're having more males than females. So we're trying to balance all of that out. So there's so much that goes into uh, distributing these captive bred birds into the wild. It's, it's uh, no easy job for those folks to do. Awesome. We have another question. Um, this one's coming from the Carolina Friends School. Jackson, uh, how will you keep monitoring the condors after the release? Well, as soon as we're off of this, um, this YouTube feed, I'm actually going to drive down the Vermont Cliffs and I'm going to set up my scope and my tripod in my chair and I'm going to settle in for a very long night. We're going to monitor these birds super closely because of those threats that I mentioned, like coyotes and golden eagles. And uh, mostly we want to make sure that they're roosting in a good spot tonight. So when condors go to bed, if you will, it's called roost. And so that happens usually an hour or two hours before dark. They'll settle into their spot for the night. And if they're not in a good spot that's inaccessible to a ground predator like a coyote, then that's a problem. And so we'll watch those birds very closely tonight as they make their way out along the Vermilion Cliffs and ensure that they're in a good spot, that they're not going to be potentially predated on by a coyote. And if they aren't in a good spot, we actually hike up the Vermilion Cliffs and get this, we pretend to be coyotes. We don't dress <laughs> up, we don't wear furs and all that stuff, but we do actually, you know, howl and yip and yell and we scare them. And we say, hey, this, this is not a good spot for you. You are susceptible to being eaten by a coyote and the bird will take off and hopefully fly to a good spot. And we'll continue to haze the bird for a little bit until it figures it out and it starts to click after, you know, a few times it's, it's hazed, it goes, ah, this is a bad spot and this is a good spot. I think I'll go to the spot where I don't get harassed. So um, they are just unaware of the predators that are out there right now because they were raised in the safety of a captive breeding program. So they're learning the ropes and they're learning it in a crash course kind of style. So it happens fast. I think it looks like 9A left the left the release pen. Um, it looks like he's tugging at the top of the, of the uh, release pen right now. So we missed that. that. <laughs> we missed that, but just wanted to let everyone know 9A is the next one out. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be scared to put it in the chat. If you see one of the five birds out there, let us know what it's doing. You can, you can keep us informed. And I'm checking <laughs> with my, I've got a, I've got a Alan up here helping me out today. So he's going to try to grab my attention once in a while as birds go and give me a little bit of an update. Yes. What about uh, last year's birds? We had five that we had released last year. Uh, yeah, those five are, let's see, four of them are currently out in the wild and they're doing great. They're flying all over Southern Utah. This is the summer months. There are sheep all over these high country mountains and condors love sheep. It's like the, the fast food for condors. They feast on dead sheep all day long up on the mountain. Uh, also, they're eating deer and elk, other ungulates, as well as other livestock, livestock like cattle. So those four birds have made their way up into the higher elevations for summer where it's cooler and there's more food and they're doing great. Like they're, they're kicking butt. Unfortunately, we did lose one bird last year and we lost that bird to a coyote predation. And that was really unfortunate. Uh, it roosted in a really poor location, uh, very, very late at night in a spot that we couldn't even get to the bird. So um, unfortunately, it was just one of those things that, you know, it happens. Uh, predation is a natural, natural cause of mortality for any wild species, uh, for any species really. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it affects about, of our diagnosed deaths, we have about 25% uh, that are due to predation. So that's fairly normal. That's not, that's not out of the realm. Of, yeah. Possibility. That's right about where we want to be. It's the lead poisoning deaths that we're really working to minimize because uh, those are right around 54% of our diagnosed mortality, which is just a little bit too high. So as you heard, you know, we're, 
in the video, we're working with uh, our partners in Arizona Game and Fish and, and the state of Utah to get non-lead ammo in the hands of hunters. And hunters are just, it's been really cool to see the response from the hunting community and how much they love condors and, and being out in nature and seeing those birds and how much they want to take part in helping solve this problem. So we're going to keep educating people and providing ammunition where we can to, to, to help the cause. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to, to get over this hurdle and get, get through to a sustaining population of condors where we're hands off. I think, like Carolina said, we want to work ourselves out of a job. That's our goal. Right. How are we doing in the pen? We still have a couple condors left, right? Hmm. What do you guys see? Uh, two condors left? Yes, that is correct. Great. Well, we still have several questions from the chat. Uh, Drew, also from Carolina Friends School, asks, how long does it take for the condors to fully develop? Well, there's a good question. So um, we do take observations of the wild nesting uh, here in Arizona. And there's a great example of that at the Navajo Bridge in Marble Canyon. We actually have a condor nestling that we have watched since the egg was laid. And so we get to get to really cool peek in on a nest cave and a nestling as it develops. And so it's a 57 day incubation roughly uh, for that egg to hatch. And so once that egg hatches, it's generally about six more months until that bird is developed enough that it can take its first flight. And that's what we call fledging. So we're all eagerly awaiting this bird in, uh, near the Navajo Bridge to fledge here in oh, about a month and a half or so. so. We're gonna keep a close eye on it as it develops. It's got a lot of its feathers in now, but it doesn't have all of them. So if it were to try to fly, it probably wouldn't, it's not the time. So let's, right. let's see a little bit more development first. Great. We have a question from Hazel. How do biologists ensure that condors, that the condors are completely ready to survive in the wild? How effectively can they simulate natural conditions? Well, you know, trial by fire. <laughs> we, have, we have to watch them as they, as they make their way into the wild now. And, and what we've found is that condors have no problem um, using the instincts that they innately have all right, we had another bird jump up onto the pen. So oh, yay! And we only have one left, but they do a really great job of actually just being condors. You know, there were a lot of questions in the early days of the program. It's like, what's going to happen? You know, we're raising birds in captivity and kicking them out into the wild. Are they going to know how to be a wild condor? And so we've gained confidence over the course of 27 years of releases. Uh, and we know that, yeah, they know exactly how to be condors. And so we're just going to monitor them at this point, try to stay as hands off as we can and watch that development. And like I said, usually over about a month, they've got it figured out. They're pretty assimilated into the flock and they know how to feed. They know how to forage on the landscape. Um, so we're just here to, to really monitor for that first month. And did we have a, a number for the bird that just left? 5A, I believe. Out? No, that wasn't it. Who was the bird that just left? Nine A, one A, and two A are all perched on the pen. So they've all technically left the release pen, but they're not really taking full advantage of that wingspan yet, where they're they're taking that big flight. And we're going to probably see that at some point today when they leave that pen. Great. Okay, so the bird that's still remaining, I can see him on my, my feed here is A0. So you guys can probably see that bird at home. So that's the last bird that needs to leave the pen uh, to bump the population up to 114 individuals here in the Southwest. And so I'm sure there've probably been some questions about you know how many condors are there in the world? Uh, there are over 500, probably over, over 550 now. So about 330 plus of those are actually in the wild between the different populations. And so we're just one population here in the Southwest. Uh, some of the other pop condor populations you might've heard of are in Southern California, uh, Central California. Uh, now we have one in the Pacific Northwest uh, with the Yurok tribe. So the Prego niche is their name for the condor. And they're doing great things with releasing birds into the wild. And I think they're going to do a, a release here coming up soon. And Bantana Wildlife Society in Central California, they're going to try to do 
a release in the fall too. I think that they're going to live stream. So lots of fun condor media out there these days. Last population is in Baja, California, Mexico. So they have a small population down there. That makes up our wild condors. Great. Well, I just would like to give a big shout out to Aaron Katzner, our former coworker mm. that usually hosts um, this, this release here in Boise uh, for this event. Uh, we miss you a lot, but we wish you all the best at the Carolina Raptor Center. Yeah, we, we do miss Aaron. I, yeah, it's, but at the same time, Alicia, it's wonderful to have you here as well. So Thank you. Uh, Aaron, Aaron passed the torch off very well and we wish her luck obviously in her new endeavors and you know maybe this is your new gig for a while <laughs> it's definitely really fun and <laughs> super exciting because the condor project is one of my favorite projects at the peregrine fund so i'm really happy to be here with you guys today we have several more questions to get to while we're waiting for the last condor to leave we have emily also from carolina raptor or not carolina raptor school Carolina Friends School, um, when a condor egg is laid in the wild, is there any observation or action taken with it? Or is it just left alone with the mother without any bi biologist influence? Um, and then is it the same once the egg hatches? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. So there are different management strategies, and uh, we're always changing those based on the needs of condors. Uh, here in the Southwest, we actually, uh, we try our hardest to let the birds do everything on their own. So uh, from the beginning, from the first egg that we had hatched back in 2003 in the Grand Canyon, that was the first wild condor hatched uh, since the recovery program started. Uh, we just kind of watched and we observed and we wanted to see what would happen. And, and they successfully fledged young back in 2003. And we've done the same thing uh, for the last, you know, 19 years since then, uh, we do step in if necessary. So if a bird's life was at risk, we would absolutely step in and take action. Um, but we're very fortunate here that we don't have some of the issues that have plagued condors uh, since condors have been reintroduced, one of those being micro trash. Uh, so in California, they've had some issues with in the earlier days, uh, especially with micro trash being ingested uh, by the parents picks up, up they're picking up food, they're picking up things like bone chips for, uh, uh, for nutrition, all sorts of things they pick up on the land. So it's common for them to pick up things like glass or bottle caps uh, and eat those and store them in their crop and then bring them back and feed them to their chicks, thinking that it's, it's nutritious when it's actually not. And so for quite a while, uh, the condors in California have been managed for micro trash where they do go in and they check mm -hmm. on the, the condor chicks as they develop those things and um, do monthly nest checks and make sure that they're not ingesting micro trash and that they have the best chance for survival. So it depends where we're at, different management strategies and different programs. Right, we have another question from Michael from Carolina Friends School. How much do you guys travel to find condors? Well, let's see, the condor range in the Southwest is generally from about the South Rim of the Grand Canyon all the way up north of Zion National Park. So that's pretty good range. That's like 120 miles. That's, that's pretty decent. Of course, if that's as the condor flies, if you're driving, good luck. That takes a heck of a lot longer. Uh, but yeah, we do have to travel pretty far and wide. And we, we try to position our different biologists. We have a crew of about seven biologists that you met and they get positioned in different places. So somebody might be up near Zion for the day or somebody might be near the North Rim for the day. And that way they can track birds with the radio telemetry and be a little bit more localized without traveling out too far and we can all communicate with each other and let our let our uh, co-workers know where birds are and where they're moving but not uncommon to see a condor fly 120 miles in a day from the south rim up to zion that actually answers uh, one of the questions one of the other questions from the chat which is how far do condors travel and do you ever see <laughs> any movement from one of the population groups to a different population group yeah, we haven't had any intermixing year, here yet with the Southwest population intermixing with the California population, but man, I bet you it's not too far off. I think that we're, we're getting closer to the point where there's enough birds in this population that are taking exploratory flights that that could happen. And I know that the Central California and the Southern California flocks, those two populations have actually met and they've exchanged birds here and there. 
um, occasionally where birds have moved from one flock to the other. So this is, uh, this is all what success looks like in a reintroduction. So these are really good things. Great. I'm also going to give another shout out to our visitors at the World Center for Birds of Prey today, watching us live from the Power Global STEM classroom at the um, at the World Center for Birds of Prey. So thank you guys for tuning in and watching with us. We also have Belle and Skylar watching in Ashland, Oregon. So thanks for tuning in. Um, we've got uh, one more chat question on here from Jake Snell. How do the monitor tags affect how the birds fly? That is a good question. And, you know, we could get into the nitty gritty on this and really get, you know, picky. Uh, but generally, the tags have very little impact on how the birds fly. This is, uh, you have to remember, this is a bird with a 20, uh, 20 pound bird with about a nine and a half foot wingspan. So it's quite large in comparison to the size and weight of the tag. So although there may be some very minimal impacts. It's certainly far, uh, it, it's much better to have a bird tag and be able to monitor it um, than not. So, um, but we're close. I mean, hopefully in another decade or so, we're just gonna have birds out there everywhere with no tags. That's ultimately our, what our goal is. We don't, we don't wanna see tags on birds. And I would love to be able to just have our crews step back and monitor populations from afar that's that's kind of where we're looking to so. and and you kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier but what is that threshold so we're we're in this program right now we want to work our, our way out of a job what's the threshold that that allows for us to not have to step in anymore mm -hmm. yeah we don't really have those numbers at the moment and they're not actually very relevant uh we have original recovery goals that were established back in the 80s uh we've kind of we're right about reaching those now but what we really need to do is overcome the last obstacle, which is lead poisoning as a cause of mortality. So uh, once we do that, we're golden. We got it. The birds got it. They've got everything else figured out. So um, just removing the threat of lead on the landscape is probably the last thing that's, that's uh, standing in the way. So the more progress we make on that, the better off the condors will be and the more chance they'll have to be self-sustaining. Yeah. Are we hearing any? Are we hearing anything fun on the radio? Yeah. Let's see. Let's hear. Eleven oh eight and ten seventy three are both out of my view. Um, sounds like they're running around on the roof, though. Yep. Okay. That's cool. That is exactly what they're doing. <laughs> nice. So Erin in the blind, she knows the birds have left, but she can't exactly see the full the full viewscape. And that's actually I'm actually near our other blind which she will be occupying later to have a better view, but she's, uh, she's thinks that they're, they're close and she's right there on the roof, which you guys can see. Cool. So, wow. They are totally just hanging out and being social. And so not far from where they are right now, there is actually a calf carcass uh, just out of your view. And um, we're hoping that these birds are hungry enough that they're going to go follow the other birds to the calf carcass and get their first wild feeding. So uh, these are what we call proffered carcasses. So that we put these out and just so you know, we don't put carcasses out and let the condors see what we're doing. We don't want to habituate condors to, to human activity. So Aaron, who's down in the pen actually went out last night in the dark and hauled five calf carcasses out to the rim and she wow. opened them up a little bit so that they'd be a little bit uh, more enticing to the birds. Uh, she did that all with a, a backpack that we have a garbage can and a backpack and she just dumped the cows in and you hike them out to the rim. That's so, amazing. <laughs> is that not a, is that not a love for a species right there that you're willing to go yes. out in the middle of the night and hike a cow? That's, that's love. amazing. That that's is exactly love. what that is. And that's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> this is a job for people who are passionate about saving species. And we're so lucky that we do have people that work in this profession that just truly care and they want to see a uh, condo recovery be a, just as successful as possible. And they pour their, everything they have into it. So, yeah. So uh, are the numbers of Connors becoming ill from lead shot ingestion increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Ah, those are great numbers. Uh, hmm. I want to be very careful about how we answer this. So uh, 
lead shot is different than lead based ammunition. So we're talking about lead bullets, which are more from, you know, big game hunting or uh, depredation of uh, varmints, varmint hunting, stuff like that, or putting down livestock. You know, this can happen anytime, you know, a deer needs to be dispatched that was hit by a car. So if you're using a lead based bullet, there's a chance for that lead to fragment and end up in that food source. So uh, we're talking specifically about lead bullets. Lead shot is more for waterfowl and upland game bird hunting. So not so much impactful to condors, but it, it can be if, if found in, in those places like deer. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, I really want to say that things are getting better. We're seeing like roughly 90% participation from the hunters than the range of the condor here in Arizona and Utah. And that says a lot. Uh, does that mean the problem is solved? No, not yet, because there's still some lead on the landscape that the condors can get into. Does it seem like the situation's getting better? Well, you know, a decade ago, we were losing six birds one year, eight birds another year. Uh, the last few years, we've lost maybe one bird. We've had birds uh, years with zero birds uh, lost to lead poisoning, uh, but we are still treating birds for lead poisoning. So it is still a concern, and we're still going to keep monitoring for that and keep treating birds for lead poisoning when we can. So it's still, it's still there. And it's, it's, it does seem to be getting a little bit better though. And I, I would say that's, you know, directly attributable to hunters taking that action and showing that conservation ethic to limit the amount of lead that goes into the landscape by switching ammunitions. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who participates in those programs. Awesome. Marie Mitchell asks, will these newly released birds recognize each other and stick together? <laughs> I wish I was uh, one of these new releases and I could just <laughs> be down there with like my walkie talkie being like, oh yeah, oh yeah, AO definitely knows what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, we love to try to get inside of the heads of these birds and they've spent the last month together uh, and they will actually hang out quite a bit together. So these these five are, are somewhat bonded to each other and we're going to probably see what happens here, but I would guess that they're going to be hanging out quite a bit together. Great. Young ones. Awesome. Is AO still hanging out? Let's see. Yeah. AO is still in there, but the other birds just took off. So the birds that were out of the pen on the perch have taken off and I'm getting word that AO is also out. So is, that, is that affirmative? AO is out of the pen? Wow. There's two in. Oh, nice. We're looking good. I think I'm going to try to get confirmation here that all the birds have left the release pen. Just oh, want to make sure. Yep, that is true. I'm seeing them go on the feed now. Ah, oh, how cool. Oh so my gosh. that means the, the Connor population is officially at 114 birds here. So congratulations, like round of applause. To Congrats the birds to everyone. To <laughs> oh my gosh, all... that's amazing. Yeah, I'm super excited. This is cool. Wow. But you know what? Now the hard work starts. Yeah. This is just like, this was the fun part. <laughs> now, now it's I going know. to flush, flush them up, right? Heading out and, yeah. and check, making sure that they're not going to, they're not going to land where they're not supposed to land. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, it's just a, uh, yeah. It's all a field effort now with, with lots of observations and just hopefully the birds, I, you know, what's really cool is the captive breeding programs do such an incredible job of uh, fostering the behaviors that we want to see in the wild through their time in captive breeding. So they provide the, the correct height perches and they provide minimal human impact, all these things that really help foster really good behaviors in the wild. And we're seeing that uh, directly when we release birds. It's like, wow, look at that bird one right to the cliff face. Perfect. <laughs> or it went right to the carcass or, you know, it's just, it's been such a treat to have birds come from captive breeding facilities that are really well-behaved wild condors. They do, they do have an impact. Great. I want to give a couple of shout outs to the folks that made today's live stream possible. Um, our Basically, our production manager, Matthew Danahel, uh, our engagement coordinator here. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you put into to getting this this you know this out to the folks here today. 
um, Dan Young, our marketing manager, and Carolina Grantham, our propagation specialist, for answering some of those questions in the chat as, as folks have asked them. Um, Paul Sperling, our director of technology uh, here, IT at the Peregrine Fund. Brett Sebring, our senior systems engineer. Taylor Rollison, our systems and user support administrator. And all the other folks that helped make today a success and, and, and being able to share this with not only the folks that are down in the Vermilion Cliffs, but everyone that's tuning in from all over uh, the world uh, for, for checking things out. So thank you guys for, 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 getting us, for getting us live today. Yeah, I really want to see uh, what's going on down below. So if you guys haven't been able to make it out to the Vermilion Cliffs, and attend one of these releases in person. Uh, I have seen many of people weep. <laughs> they, there is something really uh, visceral and emotional about watching these birds in person leave the pen uh, with you know several hundred other people who care about this uh, this cause. And so, if you haven't had a chance, try to make it out here at some point and attend the condor release on National Public Lands Day because it's something special to behold. And, we hold this every year. It's the same day. National Public Lands, Lands Day is the fourth Saturday in September. So it just happened to be 24th this year. Next year, it will be, uh, I don't know what it'll be next year. 25th. <laughs> Mark your calendars, folks. Yeah. Next, next September, end of the year, make sure you're out in the Vermilion Cliffs so you can get a chance to actually be there. It's, it's an amazing place to see condors free fly in the wild. And it's an incredible experience. I, I felt like um, every day I felt like I wanted to weep to be able to see this, this iconic bird free flying in the canyon and on the Navajo Bridge. It was just, it was incredible. And I, yeah. I definitely recommend anyone who can get out there um, that, you know, doesn't have a chance to get out to that landscape often um, get out there because it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people always ask us like, where's the best place to see condors? And I will 100% of the time say the Navajo Bridge. So get to the Navajo Bridge and then also check out the condor viewing area. But if you want to see condors up close, Navajo Bridge. I, I, we've had condors regularly fly right over our heads. You can hear the wind over their wings. It's loud. It sounds like a plane. Yeah, it sounds so, like an airplane. I was just going to say that yeah. it literally sounds like a glider going it's right so over cool. you. <laughs> and if you come uh, visit us over the next couple months, you might be able to get a look at this wild nestling that is hanging out on the cliff wall. We've usually got biologists out there or volunteers that are doing education and outreach, and they will gladly show you through their scopes uh, what a condor looks like uh, as it grows up in the wild. So we're all going to be watching super closely as this bird gets closer to fledging and um, we'll try to post some updates. And I think the best place for you guys to find those updates is on our social media pages, which you probably already found. But in case you haven't, the Peregrine Fund has uh, their own social media and we have a specific one down here with the Condor Project called Condor Cliffs. So if you look for Condor Cliffs on Facebook and Instagram, uh, you will get plenty of updates from the field and some cool shots of, of condors as they're uh, traveling through the wild Southwest. Awesome. I'm seeing uh, a couple of more chat questions here. Do you still chelate the blood to get the let out? Yeah, we do. So uh, we will start our annual trapping season uh, right near Thanksgiving. So sometime in the middle of November to the late November, we're going to start trapping every bird for their annual health checkup. And so this pen that you're looking at is actually not only a release pen, but it's also a trapping pen. So we can run it backwards and we can put calf carcasses inside of this pen and we can lure the birds, the wild birds into the pen. They drop down through the same door that the birds release uh, out of and we just shut the door and we can easily and safely handle them from in there. We'll draw a blood sample. We'll measure uh, how much um, blood uh, lead is in the blood. And if we find that those levels are extremely elevated, we can take some action and we can do what's called the chelation therapy. It's not a whole lot different than what we do with people, uh, except this is injectable. So we'll inject um, calcium EDTA into the breast muscle twice a day. 
for five consecutive days, and that will help uh, break those bonds that the lead has created with uh, calcium receptor sites and flush it out of the bloodstream and lower those uh, those lead burdens. And uh, we'll test the blood again, and hopefully it'll be low enough, and we'll release the bird back to the wild. So we'll just do this uh, with as many birds as we can trap throughout the winter season. Um, and you know, not every bird is is needing treatment, but the few birds that are, we're, we're happy to provide that for them. And just, you know, if we can save one bird, we've done a good thing. What are the symptoms of lead poisoning in condors and how do you, well, we already talked about how we treat it, yeah. but what are some of the symptoms? Yeah, that's really a tough one too, because the, the condors are so resilient. They're so hardy and they're so tough that they often don't even show us symptoms until it's almost too late. So that's why we do these annual trappings because we can't always see what's laying just below the surface. But uh, oftentimes it will affect uh, the neurological system and it will even paralyze the digestive tract. So the bird will uh, have a paralysis of the GI tract and it won't be able to, this is a severe case, for example, it won't be able to digest the food that it is consumed. And so that food will sit in the crop of the condor and the bird will slowly starve to death. Starve to death. So it's a really... A terrible thing to suffer from. So, um, yeah, this is, it's, it's rough. They can become lethargic and, uh, we'll keep an eye on all of these, all of the birds throughout the, the winter months when the threat is the highest, you know, it's, it's, it's when there's the highest chance of lead on the landscape. So, uh, during the summer months here, we're usually pretty good. We don't see a whole lot of exposure. We just got an update from the team that eight Y 8Y is on the pen and they were a 2020 release for those ah. who watched our original virtual release and is the sibling of a a zero or AO that we saw leave last um, from the pen. So just everyone that had maybe watched that first release a couple of years ago. Um, that's pretty cool. Yes. Also, just a reminder, folks, if you haven't gotten your commemorative t-shirt yet, now is the time. Tim, how long are we going to be running the t-shirt fundraiser just in case folks don't get a chance today to buy their t-shirt, but go ahead and get it if you can. Yeah, we're going to run it for a week after the event. So we'll keep uh, plugging that and try to raise as much funds for this field program as we can. Like I said, this, this whole program, um, is supported by people that care like you. Uh, we like we also do get some funding from Fish and Wildlife and our state partners, uh, but the vast majority of it actually comes from private donations. So, uh, being a nonprofit has its challenges, but it also has its perks. And working for the Peregrine Fund is definitely a perk because we get to do really cool work like save California condors. So, uh, feel free to go to peregrinefund.org and donate there, or go to our custom ink and grab yourself a t-shirt and support us that way. Lots of different ways you can help. Yeah. And I think that QR code to donate for today for that 27,000 that we're, we're trying to hit is right. I should be right on our screen um, in the bottom corner. So if you get a chance to go ahead and if you're not interested in buying a, a t-shirt, but you really want to support California condor recovery, you can go ahead and um, use that QR code. Or like Tim said, go to peregrinefund.org. There are many ways that you can, that you can help um, conserve raptors around the world. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's truly plenty of, of opportunities. So go ahead and check out our website. We have another, another question in the chat. Jim White asks, how many days can the condors go without finding food? Or is this not a problem for them to find food daily? They are uh, what we call obligate scavengers and they're opportunistic scavengers. They only scavenge and they will eat whenever they can. So condors can eat somewhere between three and four pounds of food in a single sitting. And they can slowly digest that in the crop that I was telling you about. So they can go weeks. We have seen birds go weeks without eating and be okay. So uh, it's kind of a really neat adaptive uh, trait that they have, that they can store the food in this crop uh, and it can get really big. You see condors are like massive crops. Sometimes it looks like a basketball coming out of their chest. Uh, that's uh, going to help them survive until that next meal, which might be a day or it might be 20 days. Wow. 
Birds are incredible. Just the the fact that they've got basically a little lunchbox for for later the crop that 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 is just incredible to me <laughs> that they can hang out and have food, save it until they're you know ready to kind of utilize that energy and then basically push it into their body. It's it's just so cool. <laughs> They're cool birds. And I think that, you know, sometimes we undersell the vultures, but vultures are a very at-risk species throughout the world. And it's important that we recognize the function of vultures in our ecosystems. So uh, there's a International Vulture Awareness Day that we celebrate every year. That happened just a, a few weeks back. Um, just, I, I encourage you all to learn more about vultures and the role that they play in our environment in keeping us healthy and, uh, and, and promote them, you know, tell your friends about how cool vultures are. Uh, we, they get a bad rep too. They, people say that they're not very pretty. Uh, try working with condors for, you know, for 10 years and then you'll see, you'll see how beautiful they are. You will. Props. Yeah. I think um, the, the thing that we talk about here a lot at the headquarters for the Peregrine Fund at the, at the World Center is about how vultures in general are just nature's cleanup crew. They literally take care of cleaning up the environment and they are our partners, right? At cleaning up the environment. And so rather than think that they're dirty, they're actually literally cleaning up um, the environment. I believe there's 20, between 21 and 24 vulture species around the world. And, and a lot of them, I think 16 or 17 of them are threatened um, which is, is incredible. Um, and it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, not understanding their place in the environment. And it's, it's really important for, for folks to understand that they are, they're keeping disease at bay. They are cleaning up. They are just incredible. They give so much to the ecosystem. They, they provide so many ecosystem services that we want to keep them around. So I just wanted to, to share how much I, how much I love vultures. <laughs> well said. Well said. We're in the vulture lovers club. We love vultures. Yes. And then just like you had mentioned, I've had International Vulture Awareness Day. Um, that is the first Saturday, I believe, in September. Um, so if folks are interested in celebrating IVAD, um, you know, you can, if you're local to, to Boise, you can come out to the World Center for Birds of Prey. We tend to to do some fun educational things here, but um, just sharing the stories about vultures with your with your friends and family can can really help um, move that needle, you know, um, in the, in the right direction for for vulture conservation. And I think that was the last big question that I had asked there from our chat and I think since all the birds are out and we've we've connected I think we can we can start to wrap up for the day so you guys can actually get back to the the groundwork and making sure that these birds are thriving on the landscape I wish that we could sit here and do this all day <laughs> uh, but yeah we have some really important work to do so I think uh, wrapping it up is in order and I just want to Wow. Say how, how, how well that went is from the bird's perspective. I, I couldn't have asked for a better outcome, having those birds very comfortably and confidently leave that release pen. That was really cool to watch. Um, there is so many people like we've talked about throughout the program that make this possible and make this happen. And I think that we have to thank all of them one more time. And first and foremost, we should thank the Bureau of Land Management because this is, again, National Public Lands Day. We're celebrating our national uh, public lands. And the fact that condors exist on public lands out here in the Southwest is a gift. So uh, support your public lands, support the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, thanks to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for managing the entirety of the condor recovery. Uh, they're great partners to work with, and uh, uh, they do a great job. They really do. Uh, Arizona Game and Fish and the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, our state partners are incredibly important, especially when it comes to educating the hunting community and shooters out on the landscape. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't make the progress that we've made without them. 
And that goes for the North American Non-Lead Partnership too. So if you want to find out more about the North American Non-Lead Partnership, go to, uh, uh, you can search for North American Non-Lead Partnership. I think it's nonleadpartnership.org. Uh, you can also go to huntingwithnonlead.org. And they're great resources if you want to learn more about what's being done to tackle the lead issue. Uh, the National Park Service, Grand Canyon and Zion National Park Service. Wow. Uh, yeah, we, we appreciate every bit of monitoring that those, those folks are able to do to assist the condor recovery. Uh, the Kaibab National Forest and the Dixie National Forest, uh, they've been fantastic partners too to work with. Um, gosh, yeah, it's reminding me of all the different people in these organizations <laughs> that, that uh, I've worked with over the last year that uh, have, have helped us achieve the goals that we're achieving today. So thank you. All the captive breeding facilities, uh, in zoos that are involved in this program, uh, and especially Liberty Wildlife. Um, Jan Miller and Alex Doth go down there at Liberty Wildlife, do an incredible job with our birds. If we should have a bird like 999 that needs a little bit of a, a leg up as it uh, encountered something <laughs> like a golden eagle uh, or a coyote, uh, they're phenomenal at what they do, and they're they're saving condors when when they need when they need to. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen very often and it doesn't happen too often, uh, but they're there when we need them. So thank you to Liberty Wildlife and all the work they do. They're also a nonprofit. So go to libertywildlife.org and support the work that they do because they're helping to save condors amongst any, so many other bird species. Um, also the field crew, they're down there working hard. We're going to go see them. We couldn't do it without that hardworking crew and the team of volunteers I wish that I could uh, sit here and name off every single volunteer that is working down there and is going to help us over the next few days. Uh, the list is long, um, and we'll try to highlight some of those folks in our social media pages. But it does uh, take a village, as we like to say, and you guys are part of that village. So thank you so much for supporting this and uh, being here with us while we get these birds acclimated to the desert southwest. Yes, thank you to the audience. Thank you to everyone that's viewing and, and stuck, with, stuck with us through this whole event. Um, it is really amazing to be a part of it. And, and it's so amazing to be able to share it with all of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the audience and everyone that was involved with today's release and everyone that does the work that they do to help save species, especially this California condor. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Tim, for, for tuning in from Marble Canyon. Yeah, great. It's what it's been a wonderful, wonderful day up here and, uh, we're going to go get to work. So thanks Alicia for being a great host and having me out here today in the field. And I guess we'll see everybody next year. Yes. Tune in. All right. Good luck. Right. Bye everyone. We'll see you later. Have a good one.